classroom English. Classroom English has a couple of different definitions. If I were speaking from a perspective of teaching English as a foreign language, teaching English as a second language, this is the definition that I would use. I would say that classroom English is authentic English used in an EFL, ESL classroom for authentic communication. That would be my definition. Do you have any questions? Excellent question. I'm so happy that you asked that. So authentic means real. So in the case of when I say real English, this means that I am using English not for teaching English, but I'm using English to do something. Okay? Now, let's, uh, everyone understands EFL, ESL? What's the name? No? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent. Good, good. EFL is English as a foreign language, which all of you are EFL students. You're all learning English as a foreign language because you don't speak Korean or English in Korea. If you're living in an English-speaking country like the United States, Canada, Australia, England, then you would be ESL students because you are living in an English-speaking country. Okay? They're very similar. There's slight differences. Um, because you're the camera. Thanks. Okay. So, authentic communication. For example, if I bring a, um, a textbook that is written in, in English, that is used for teaching English in a foreign language, or teaching English as a foreign language, that textbook, is that textbook, is that an authentic material? No, it's not, okay? Because that textbook is created and designed for teaching English. Now, if I bring a textbook that is written in English, and it's a history textbook, okay, is that an authentic material for an EFL or ESL classroom? Yes. yes, because the textbook was written in English for teaching history, not for teaching English. But I'm using it in the classroom for teaching history. That's an authentic material. Now, will you learn English in the process? Probably, okay? But that is an authentic material. So, the classroom, in classroom English is using authentic English in a classroom, authentic materials in a classroom for authentic communication, which means that we are not using English for teaching English. We are using English to do things or to learn other subjects. Let's think about, in a couple of weeks, you will go to the elementary school for your teaching practice. Now, just not English class, but just any, any elementary school classroom. What might be some problems, some common problems in elementary English class, or in an elementary classroom? Any subject. What might be some problems? Okay, maybe students not concentrating, students maybe uh, not paying attention. Excellent. What else? Lack of communication between the teacher. Okay, well that's certainly not going to be the student's prob or fault. That would be the teacher's fault, but excellent. Okay, maybe a lack of interaction between the teacher and the students. Great. Any other problems that might be in the elementary classroom? No ideas? Well, any, any subject. Not just English, but just any, like maybe for math class or, or Korean class or science class. What might be a kind of problem that you might have in the classroom when you're a teacher? No ideas? Okay, and okay, and that's a, that's going to be a, a content problem. Yeah, that's going to be a content issue. That's a methodological issue, a problem. <clears throat> I mean, maybe you might have kids that are doing mean things to other students, right? 
Maybe you might have kids fighting in class. You might have kids making little paper balls and hitting girls in the back <laughs> of the head, right? Okay, so we might have some kind of behavioral problems and you, you will probably experience, okay, in two weeks. Let's think about if, let's say sometimes um, boys are throwing little paper balls at each other in class, okay? What would you do as a teacher if that happened? Stop. <laughs> okay, you tell us, okay, stop, don't do that. How might we, how might we prevent that from happening in the future? I'm sure you guys have talked about this in some of your other classes. What are some things that teachers do in their classrooms to, to uh, direct student behavior or to prevent bad behavior? Well, certainly punishment. Certainly teachers will use punishment. We might think of some other ways of doing things that don't involve the punishment. Maybe sometimes teachers will make a list of rules or even a list of good behaviors and bad behaviors, maybe. Maybe sometimes to help young children understand the words, what do we do? We also might use pictures of good behaviors and bad behaviors. So maybe let's say, for example, that you have some good behaviors, you have some bad behaviors that you want to affect in the classroom. Maybe you use pictures with words, you know, do not throw paper in class. And you have a picture of a boy throwing paper in class, right? And you put that up on the wall. Well, if you did that in English, That would be authentic English. You're not trying to teach English. What you're doing is you're trying to prevent bad behavior in the classroom. So you make a little picture, you make a rule, but in this case you did it in English. Okay? That would be an example of classroom English. Okay? If a student said if a student is standing and students like this. You say, oh, do you need to go to the bathroom? <laughs> okay, you use English, not because you're teaching English, but because I think that student needs to go to the bathroom, and I'm going to ask that student, do you need to go to the bathroom? Okay, so this is an example of authentic English. Now, this is different, though, than a lot of what we find in Korea with classroom English. In Korea, what we generally find is that classroom English becomes this kind of um, set phrases. Generally speaking, classroom English exhibits itself as an extensive set of English phrases used in an EFL, ESL classroom to present lessons and lead a class in English. And then, so the teachers memorize these lines and then they teach the words to the students and they have the students repeat the words. Good morning, class, or as Good morning, everybody. Look up at the top. Or, Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> or, hello, everyone. My name is Mr. Kim. I'm your new English t teacher today. I'm your new English teacher. You know, you know. Hi, I'm Damon. How are you today? Hi, thank hey. you. <laughs> Nobody speaks like that <laughs> in English-speaking countries. Okay, but you skip my point here, is that what happens a lot is that people, they begin just like teaching these phrases. So what they're doing is that they're teaching English to teach English. Whereas, what I really want us to think about is I want to think about you, you have your English ability, and we use our English ability to do things that are not about teaching. Okay. That's kind of my feeling for classroom English. If you want to know, again, <laughs> now, next, next part. If we, in the world, okay, in the world, children speak language. We go to Brazil, 
young children speak Brazilian. If we go to Korea, young children speak Korean. If we go to England, young, young children speak English. Language is very, very difficult <coughs> to learn. Okay? It's very difficult and very complex. And yet all children in the world, as long as their you know, brains are functioning well, okay, learn a language. All of you spoke Korean before you ever went to elementary school. Okay? So we don't need teachers to learn a language. Okay? What, how? How did you, all of you spoke Korean when you were young children, how did you learn Korean? How did you learn Korean? Which is a very difficult and very complex thing. One of the languages are one of the most complex things in the world. How did you learn Korean? <laughs> listening, okay. But not just listening, but listening. What else? Okay. And a lot of a lot of times we do a lot of mimicking. We do mimicking and imitating of parents. What else? We often are trying to speak Korean. Why? Why do we even try to speak Korean? Why do children even try to speak Korean? <laughs> okay, go with that. Use a different word. What does that mean to survive? <laughs> huh? <laughs> okay, we have desires. We have desires and we have needs. Right? The little baby goes, mm. And the mother says, oh, do you want a hug? Mm. <laughs> or the baby goes, or the baby goes, mm. Mm. And the mother says, oh, do you want some water? And the baby goes, mm. Okay? Is that we have needs. We have what are called intentions. Okay? And we, in the process of trying to communicate our needs, to meet our needs, trying to communicate our intentions, we try to communicate. Now, the, the process of mimicking, the process of listening, is very much part of that process as well. Okay? So, this is interesting because kids, we look at children, um, I think it's 12 to 18 months. One second, that's the time. I forget what my notes. Okay? We find that children, by the age of 12, 12 to 18 months, begin exhibiting grammar. Okay? Children by the age of 12 to 18 months begin to use some forms of grammar. Did your parents teach you grammar? No. Probably never. Your parents probably never taught you grammar. Okay? By the age of five, this is American age, five, this is some studies coming from the United States, is that by the age of five, children, most children, are able to use compound and reasonably complex sentences. A compound sentence would be like a conditional sentence. Ha myung. Okay? By the age of five, children are able to use reasonably complex and compound sentences. By the age of five, children are able have a are able to use and understand most grammar forms. Present tense, future tense, past tense, past perfect, past progressive, future continuous, <laughs> da 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 da. Okay, children are, they don't know, they don't know, oh, that is future progressive. They don't know the name of the tense, but they're able to understand and use the tense by the age of five. By the age of five, children have a vocabulary of, on average, about 5,000 to 7,000 words. That's for English, okay? So my point here, though, is just that these kids are learning something. All of you, I say, hey, let's study grammar. You're like, <laughs> That's so difficult. But notice that children at a very young age learn grammar, learn language, learn words, by ne but without studying. And without the parents, the parents are never teaching them grammar. Never, for the most part, usually not teaching them any kind of vocabulary. It's formal, formal, you know, there's no real formal teaching there. So what I want you to think about, so I want you to think about children for a moment. Let's think about, I want you to make a list of traits in the box. There's a box there. Just, let's just go for many, many traits. I want you to think about children. What are the traits of children? Characteristics of children. What are their traits? 
If, if you think of the word in Korean, just write the word in Korean and then ask group members, well, what is this word in English? And then write it in English, okay? Okay. So, let's go on to the next part. You guys will need to maybe hurry at the end. I don't, we gotta make sure we have enough time. Yeah, yeah, I'm running out of time already. We're not even halfway finished. Okay, so now let's think about parents and caretakers. And again, all of, if we look in all cultures in the world, okay, there's a big variety of cultures in the world. There's a big variety of languages in the world. Despite all the different cultures and all the different languages, is that we find that children learn language, okay? In all cultures, children learn and speak languages from a very young age. <clears throat> what is similar across all the cultures that allows for this? What, what are some similarities in all cultures that we can find that maybe helps children learn language? Because not all cultures have teachers not all cultures have schools. Well, okay, we do have parents. Par I think that's probably very important. What about parents? What about parents that helps? I mean, let's face it. When I said, how did you learn a language? You guys said, oh, my parents. <laughs> you said, my parents. Yeah, good. What about parents? What, what is it about parents that really help children learn a language? A parent. Be the role model of their children. Okay, so parents are role models. Absolutely. And they, the young children, be their parents and repeat their thinking and repeat their action. Okay. And they, the children do doing like that and they learn the. Okay. The so parent. Parents provide a good model, and we will actually talk about modeling models. Uh, parents model appropriate language within the situation. Good, excellent. Anything more about parents? The parents already uh, experience the process of learning language, so they know what is hard and easy for the children, so they can teach easily and effectively. Okay, okay. All right, I, I don't know if it's as conscious as you're making it there, but I think that you are making a good point. We, uh, we especially actually find this with mothers more than fathers, uh, but, but they both do it, and it's called accommodation, is that parents will modify their language uh, to kind of match better the child's language ability and the child's understanding. Excellent, good, excellent. I think you guys have both identified two, two points that are absolutely probably true across all cultures in the world. Any other, any, anything else? What's interesting, I know something about your parents. Because you are here right now. Because you are here right now, I know something about your parents. And this is from studies that we that we have found is that basically from about the age of it's about 18 months is that your relationship with your mother is one of the best predictors of will you go to university and all of you are here right now so I know that when you were 18 months old your mother loved you <laughs> Absolutely. So this is something that's really, really interesting. And uh, next week we'll talk more about this in regards to how does this relate to language. Is that loving and caring for a child is actually one of the best predictors for how will that child succeed in the educational system. It's a very important, essential element, essential part of learning a language. And just so you know, learning a language is connected to 
all kinds of learning. Okay? You can't learn computer programming without learning a language. You can't learn math without learning a language. You can't probably learn advanced mountain climbing without learning a language. So, so that ability, learning a language is very connected to love. And the feelings and the emotions that parents have for their kids. Because parents or care to other caretakers, they will do anything to help children. Okay? They want the best for the child. They want to help the child achieve a greater life, a better life, or something good. And this is very, very important. And I hope, I hope that you think about this deeply. Because no matter, no matter what you learn at this school, nothing will be as important about as, as why do you want to be a teacher? Do you have a genuine desire, a genuine passion that you want to help children? Because, <clears throat> excuse me, that is, is what's going to drive the child's ability to learn. That's what we find across all cultures in the world, is that parents really love their children, they want the best for their children, and that really is part of the condition, that's part of the condition that helps drive learning.